Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are going to get started with some praise and worship here, so feel free to stand and join us.
Good morning, everybody. So we've got some announcements for you this morning. But first, we're just going to take a moment and pray. So thank you, Father, that we can be here today. Thank you that we can glorify your name. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. Thank you, Father, for your spirit and your anointing. We ask that your spirit would dwell among us here this morning. We ask that hearts would receive what you have for them this morning. God, we ask that your will would be done in this place. And we just anoint um, Matt as he shares your word here this morning. And Father, we just want to give you all the praise and all the glory for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, so here's what's happening this coming week. Oh, that's a little bit fake. Okay, so we have the Pass Creek Music Festival. That's going to be happening next weekend. That is Saturday, July 23rd at 6 p.m., as well as Sunday, July 24th at 10.30. Now, we are still going to have church here, but we don't judge if you want to be there instead. <laughs> so go on out Saturday at 6, Sunday at 10.30. That's going to be at the Pass Creek. Creek Exhibition Grounds, and admission is going to be done by donation, and they're going to be raising funds for the Ukraine um, to support the humanitarian efforts there. So what you can bring is a lawn chair, sweater, bug repellent. We were actually there for a wedding last night. We were eaten alive, and we had bug spray on. So I would bring bug spray and like long sleeves, everything. So, um, and then an umbrella and some dancing shoes. So that's going to be fun. All right. And we have weekly prayer going on both Thursday morning at 10 a.m. and Sunday morning at 9 a.m. here in the fireside room. So if you want to come out and pray with us, that's happening twice a week. So tithes and offerings. You might wonder. Why do we give? Well, because God tells us to. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled and to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, when I read that verse, I don't hear, Give God your money and he'll give you back more money. I hear, honor the Lord with your wealth, and he will provide for you more than what you need. He knows what we need, and he wants to bless us abundantly. So if we are obedient in giving him our tithes and offerings, he's going to make sure that our needs are more than met. So, um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 
to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Hallelujah. So that is why we give. And this is how we can give. We can do cash in an envelope here, as well as check in an envelope. You'll have envelopes here in your pews. And you can also send an e-transfer to donations.nbcc at gmail.com. And I think that's all we have for announcements this morning. So I'm going to invite Matt up to share the word. Thank you, thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, before I share the word, I'll just uh, give an update. This is the third Sunday of the month, and according to my phone calendar, that means it's Missionary Sunday. Thankfully, my phone reminds me every month, which is so good. And uh, this month, I want to remind us of our support of the enemies uh, who are working um, overseas in a location that I'm not going to name since we're on Facebook Live. And uh, really excited for the work that they're doing. I just got a report actually from them um, like two days ago. And uh, they are back overseas. They were furloughed here in Canada thanks to COVID for a couple of years. Working Zoom five days a week with teams on the ground. And uh, last month I got to share with you that they have actually now translated. So uh, the work that they do with Wycliffe Bible Institute is they translate the Word of God into local languages so that um, local people can read the word in a dialect that they fully understand, rather than needing to deal with translations to perhaps larger uh, community centers around them that speak a different language than they would normally speak in the home place. And so uh, last month, what they started doing was these things called tastes of translation. And, uh, and so they would make like, uh, they would take sections of scripture, translate it into local languages, give it to local church leaders, and then allow them to be able to, to preach the word of God in a local dialect and gauge the responsiveness of the congregation to see whether or not it was worth spending uh, hundreds of man hours and woman hours going through and translating the rest of the New and Old Testament into those dialects. And now they're on the ground, able to go around to these communities, and they said that in this last week they've gotten to pop into three different congregations that have held midweek meetings and get to hear and see the engagement of individuals as the scriptures read in their vocal dialect. And they said it was just overwhelming the responsiveness of people to that because all of a sudden it went from being words in someone else's languages to Jesus is speaking in my language. And so, what an exciting opportunity that they have and work that they're doing. And so, if you would like to help support their work, um, you are welcome to write your name on the offering envelope um, in front of you. And you can come back to the front. Do you have more to say? <laughs> well, teamwork today. There's actually two more announcements. Oh. My part was done, but Greg has some announcements for us that we're going to see up on the screen. So, we're just going to take a quick seat and we're going to watch those videos. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Pastor Brandon, and I've got an announcement for you guys today. So VBS, or Nelson Kids Camp, is going to be coming next month. And we're going to need volunteers for this five-day program, which is going to be happening from August 15th to the 19th, from 9 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. Volunteers might need a little bit more time before and after for setting up and tearing down, but we love to see more people come together and help us run this program for kids in the middle of August. Now we're gonna need games leaders, crafts leaders, and assistants to help run the activities and supervise the kids. Don't worry, we won't be doing every single thing that is listed there. We need certain people to run certain activities, so you won't be doing every single thing. We're also gonna need snacks, so anyone out there who loves to bake, we're looking for cookies, preferably some that don't have peanuts and Maybe a few that are possibly gluten-free. So yeah, we're going to need cookies for our snacks for all five days of Kids Camp. For more information or if you'd like to register your kids for our Kids Camp, send us an email at nelsonbethelkids at gmail.com. 
I hope everyone is just as excited as we are. We are looking forward to an amazing week-long program this August at Bethel Christian Center. Hey you guys, look at that! That's amazing! Uh-huh. Whoa! Look over there! Have you guys seen anything as massive as that? Great! Those plants are huge! I've never seen anything like it! Yeah! Well, we're here! Looks like everyone else just got here too! It's time to look up! There's more to life than what's on your screen! on the adventure of a lifetime and experience the greatness of God's love. There we go. Promo video and uh, Greg's little announcement there for uh, for VBS happening this year in August. Fifteen dollars per child um, for the morning. And so if you uh, know neighbors and you want to um, not kidnap them, but you know send them to the church, um, let us know. We'd love to have them here. What's really great is we're actually partnering with um, the Covenant Church in Balfour. They're going to be running the VBS. Uh, Two weeks earlier, Greg's going to be helping, and then uh, we'll be hosting it here as well. And so if you are interested in either helping with volunteering, uh, signing up your kids, or cooking, baking cookies, uh, please chat with, uh, with Greg after the service. He's downstairs presently, but he'll come up after the service, and you can chat with him then. Yes, it is kindergarten through grade five. Yeah, is the age range. And so if you are K through five, None of you up here, maybe Jasper's almost came through five. Um, uh, you can sign up for that, which will be great. And uh, this year, you know, we'll, uh, we're excited to see the BBS run. So with that, we're going to get into this morning's message. And so why don't we just uh, pray, and uh, then we'll, we'll begin our sermon. So Father God, we just thank you for today. We thank you that we can gather, that we can declare your name is holy above all things. Lord God, and as we sang multiple times this morning, there is no one like you. And there is no one that is comparable to you, O oh God. And so, Father, as we would uh, go through your word this morning, Lord, would you speak to our hearts, to our minds? Would you heal our hearts? Would you teach our minds? Would you activate our hands, O oh God, that we would um, not only hear, but do what your word calls us to do, Lord God. We thank you uh, that you are not a God who is inactive, but you are active and you are present and you are desiring to lead us into all truth. We thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, my name is Matt. Uh, for those of you who are, haven't gotten the chance to meet uh, this morning, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today we are going to be looking at a sermon um, that I'm call, calling Pressing On. And our feature verse will be found in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse, verse 13 um, and, uh, and 14. And um, today, as we look at this, I want to talk about this concept that you and I are on a journey um, called life together. Who knows we're on a journey called life? Yeah, by like two people. That's great. The rest are confused. That's fine. Hey, thanks for being here. Hopefully, you know, we'll have some common ground at the end of this. Um, but when we are going through life, there are so many things that we get to think about, right? We get to think about the things that have happened to us, the things that are going on now, and the things that are coming up in the future. And uh, the Word of God does not shy away from the past, the present, and the future. And yet, at the same time, um, the Word of God tells us to look forward in hopeful expectation and anticipation to what God is doing 
And uh, you read in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews writes that the one who promises is faithful to deliver unto completion. And so I want to come before you today, church, and encourage you that regardless of where you are on the journey of life, uh, be in age or maturity within the Christian faith or experience or challenges that you're facing today, that God, who is promising things in your life, is faithful to bring them through to completion. And I want to encourage you to press on, to press on to the things that God has. Paul writes to the church in, in Philippi, he says, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining or pressing forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God through Jesus Christ. And I think that that is uh, an, an incredibly powerful and potent verse for Paul to write to the Philippians. And one, that as we look at the story of the Philippians, Paul wrote this letter to the church of Philippi while he was in jail. You're not doing a whole lot of straining and pressing on when you're in handcuffs behind bars. And yet Paul's view of what it meant to follow after God was this constant pressing on, not a, not a striving to prove oneself, but a pressing on to the things that God has. And he says it right here, he says, for the, uh, for the race that God has set before me in Christ Jesus. Who knows that we're running a race in this life? And it's not a race to see who win get wins. It's not like we get to, to the end and I'm like, ha, beat you. I knew my split time of my 500 meter running was gonna pay off eventually. It's a race that we actually get to run together. A race against time, amen. We're losing that one. Um, have you guys ever seen those uh, motivational videos that come up on your Instagram reel? Never went over the age of 40, like no. Um, but that's okay, let me explain it to you. There's these ins inspirational vi videos and Instagram likes to track what you watch and then they just give you more content of what you like to watch so that you'll stay on their platform for hours, which is why you can also set a limit on the amount of time you're on the Instagram app. Genius, so I only waste six hours of my day, not 12. Um, and so there's these videos that I absolutely love. And they're of races, you know, a bike race, a running race, uh, and you're just getting to the finish line, and the leader of the race begins to wobble because they've been running for 19 hours, and they, they get tired, and the second place person, rather than blowing past them, comes alongside and kind of grabs their waist or crosses an arm under their shoulders, and they limp across the finish line together. And that's this image that we have of the church. We're not racing against each other, we're racing with one another to the goal that Christ has, to the prize that he has um, for us. And so church, I wanna encourage you to press on together. During this journey, uh, this sojourner, we're called, uh, of pursuing Jesus, we can tend to fall into a couple of things. We can fall into an empathetic thing where we just kind of lose heart and motivation in the midst of the race. I recently drove to Ontario, and there was moments where I was like, this is a long drive. And I kind of lost heart, especially on day two of the three-day journey, because I'd been awake for basically 28 hours straight, driving for 24 of them and rolling around in a sleeping bag in the back of the car, not able to sleep for the other four. And I, and I got to, um, I was two hours outside of Thunder Bay. And the time changed, and I was so demoralized because I thought I was getting to Thunder Bay at 9 p.m. And I was gonna get to like just, I was like, I'm gonna go grab dinner, and I might go to like a gym and just walk on a treadmill to, because I've been sitting. And then I realized, oh, I'm looking at the wrong clock. And I'm actually gonna get to Thunder Bay at 11.30 at night. And I still have another 16 hours to drive tomorrow. And I was totally crushed and demoralized. And I couldn't call anyone because there's no service. And so it's just me and my goofy voices talking about road signs, trying to keep myself motivated and full of hope on this drive to get to Ontario in a timely manner. And I was, whoa, the wind in my sails was just totally gone. I don't know how I got into Thunder Bay without falling asleep. I, I don't even think I took my clothes off. I hit the bed. 
I woke up eight hours later, I got back in the car and I left. And that was my time in Thunder Bay. It was short and sweet. But we can become empathetic. We can become a little numb to the journey that we're on. Now that's a, a short version of it. But how many of us in life wake up one day and we realize for the last 10 years, we're like, I'm not sure what I've done. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've done a bit of an assessment here. It's been a while, and now I'm empathetic, and now I've lost a bit of hope in those dreams and in those callings that God's placed upon my life. And we go, God, where are you? And what is going on? Because there were such promises that you had spoken into me, but I've, I've, I've become a little empathetic in them. I've become a little melatonin. Melaton I'm going to skip it. I'm, and, and I'm just, God, the passion and the fire I had has kind of waned. And I'm feeling tired, maybe burnt out, maybe, maybe we're just not really sure if it's worth it anymore to rekindle that fire and to continue to run that race that God has for us. Another thing we can do while we run this race is we run it looking backwards. Have you guys ever ran while looking backwards? Super dangerous, isn't it? Would you run on a forest path while looking backwards? No. Would you run on a forest path while looking backwards if you had ran that same trail every day for a year? Still not. Guess what? What you do tomorrow is totally new. You haven't been through this life before. And yet many of us race through life looking backwards at things that were, not paying attention to where we are right now, and where God is leading us. God has brought us to this present moment, and he's leading us into his future. Why? Because he's made promises, and he is faithful to deliver on them. But many of us are running like this. Hey, remember that awesome time back there? Hey, remember when this happened back there? And what we end up doing is rather than journeying towards what Jesus is doing, we actually take these moments in our lives that God has established as checkpoints for us to recognize his goodness, and we've pitched a tent. And we're like, I like this checkpoint. I'm just going to stay here for a little bit. I'm going to pitch a tent, build a little fire pit. I'm going to find me a, a deer, and I'm going a, I'm to a build a knife. And the next thing we know, we're 30 years in a campsite. When God just intended for us to have a checkpoint in a race, in a journey that we're following after him. I went through a time in my life a couple years ago where I was heavily addicted to Red Bull TV watching ultra marathon races. I'm talking like 100 kilometer races through the, like, the French Alps. Riveting. Loved it. I was like, I want to do this with my life. I do not want to deal with my life, but I was heavily addicted to it. And these individuals, these athletes were trained to run a hundred kilometers up and down and through and around these mountainous terrain. And they would have checkpoints because there's no trails. They just have a map and they're like, I need to get to that mountain and then this one, and then there's my water pickup. And then this is where I need to check in by this time to continue to be in the race. And on these races, they would have to sleep. You're not running 100 k straight. You're sleeping out in the mountains. You're, you're resting. And sometimes these athletes, trained professionals who have been doing this for years, they get to a checkpoint and they lie down and they wouldn't get up soon enough to get to the next checkpoint. They had built a campsite where they were solely supposed to just check in and keep going. Now, unlike that race, God has grace and he brings us back to where we need to be. He doesn't leave us there. He, he brings us forward. He sees us back into the present. And so I want to, as we go through this, this sermon, we're, we're going to look about when we look back, how it actually distracts us from doing what God's called us to do today. He, he says that his mercies are new every day. I'm so grateful for the mercies that he had for me yesterday, but I'm excited that he has new mercies for me tomorrow. And I don't need to camp on these mercies, because I know his mercies are coming tomorrow as well. I know I can strive and press on to what God is doing tomorrow, because he is faithful and he has promised in it. Jeremiah chapter 29, 
verses 4 through 9, and, and verse 11 through 13, speak clearly about the fact that God has a plan for us. And Jeremiah 29, 11 is probably one of the most well-known Bible verses outside of John 3, 16, right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you and to, to see you uh, do all, uh, I don't even know the verse all, all off the top of my head, but you, you know Jeremiah 29, 11, you know the gist of it. God has a plan and a purpose for me, and it's for, uh, it's for prosperity and not for suffering and, and I know this stuff and it's so good but I want you to know Jeremiah 29 11 is a promise that is founded upon the principles of Jeremiah 29 4 through 9 and in Jeremiah 29 4 through 9 this is what God declares he is speaking to the exiles in Babylon and he says hey while you're in Babylon and who knows that when you're exiled to a land you don't really want to be there you're like, God, just get me out of this place that I'm exiled to. And God says to the Israelites, he says, hey, I want you to build houses here. I want you to plant gardens here. I want you to, to marry off your children and see their children married off. I want you to seek the prosperity and the blessing of the community you've been planted in. Why? Because I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. He knows our plans. I can guarantee you the exiled Israelites' plans would just let me get back to my homeland. But God says, no, I actually have a better plan for you here. I have something for you here. And it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be hard, and it'd be very easy for the Israelites to look back and be like, but back then it was so good. Remember how awesome it was? We had our street parties and our block parties, and we had neighbors, and we loved it, and we had community. And now I'm over here, and this is hard, God. And I don't like this. And God's like, but this is part of my promise to you as I refine you. If you're in the midst of going through a challenging moment, looking back is only good for perspective of what God's done, not in hopes that he'll do, that, that he'll just put you back in that place. Because I'll tell you something your brain does to trick you. It forgets traumas or it blocks traumas. Let me bring you to a story in, uh, in Numbers chapter 11. I love the story of the Israelites. Exodus from Egypt. Again, the Israelites in Egypt, they're slaves. This is not a great place for them to be. Through 10 miraculous demonstrations of God's power, the Egyptians finally release the Israelites to leave. And in fact, as they do so, the word says the Israelites plundered Egypt because the Egyptians were like, leave! And while you leave, take my gold earrings and my purple robes and all my favorite dishes that Aunt Cindy inherited to me and just take them and get out of here, is what the Egyptians say to the Israelites. And it's with those articles that the Israelites build the temple of the Lord. The, the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the Tent of Meeting. And God says, you will, you will plunder the Egyptians. Those who enslaved you, you will plunder. My, what promises of the Lord they had seen. God speaks this promise into the Israelites. He's, he says, I'm going to lead you into the promised land. Sounds pretty good. Thank you, Jesus. I'd love to go to the promised land. What's in it? It's flowing with milk and honey. I like those things. Do we at least get some bread and cereal? Yes, you do. Yes. I want to go to the promised land. And so they leave Egypt. And if you look at a map, Egypt to the promised land, it's about a two and a half day journey. The Israelites took 40 years. They took 40 years to walk two and a half days. That's like they were whole children. When you're trying to leave the house, you're like, God, we got five minutes to go. And then 15 minutes after you were supposed to leave, the kids were like, are we leaving? words. 40 years to walk two and a half days it took the Israelites and they saw the miraculous power of God at work in Egypt. At work when, the, when, they, when he made highways out of seas we sang this morning. You make highways out of seas. He parts the Red Sea and they walk through and they see the decimation of the Egyptian army that was pursuing them. Then they get to the other side, they sing these beautiful songs of praise, their harps and lyres and timbrels, and they're dancing, and they're, they're praising the name of the Lord. They see all these incredible things start to take place, 
and then they become empathetic and they start to look behind them and they begin to complain. And the people complain in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes in the desert. Because the desert's not a great place to be. But we have to go through the desert to get to the promised land. And they begin to complain about their misfortunes. In fact, God became, became so tired of their complaining about their misfortunes, he began to burn the edges of their camp. Little fires started everywhere. And they're like, ah! Moses prayed to God. And Moses prayed, and the fires went out. And in verse 4, listen to this. Talk about looking behind you and blocking out the things that have happened. Now, the rabble that was among them. A rabble means just a, a small group, but very vocal. Had a very strong craving. They were sensual in their needs. And the, the whole tribe of Israel began to weep aloud. This is why we have to be very careful of this to the voices that we listen to. Because a rabble can cause an entire nation to enter into a strong craving. This, listen to this rabble, okay? Picture this. You were slaves. You saw the power of God. Seas were parted. Dry ground was made available. You praised, you danced, you sang, you were cast free from the bondage of, it, of Egypt, only for this to become your cry. Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we had in Egypt that cost nothing. This is my favorite part. And the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions. Like, man, if I'm going to think about something that I like from my past, it is not cucumbers and leeks. But the Israelites felt that the desert was such an atrocious place that they would rather go back to slavery in Egypt to eat cucumbers, leeks, and onions than to every morning wake up and have the, uh, the immediate provision of God's manna, food provided every single day for them. Every single day. They didn't need to quit. They didn't go out and farm the manna. They just woke up and there was, there was this delicious cakey bread everywhere. And they got bored of the miraculous work of God. And they said, man, I really wish we just had some cucumbers and onions to eat today instead of this stuff that the Lord's provided. Who is this Lord anyways? Does he even care? Does he even remember the promises he's spoken? I'm going back to what, what was. Because it feels more comfortable and I remember the good things about it because right now it's really hard. And church, I've had these moments Right? You change jobs and everything's great for the first few months. You're in the honeymoon of the new job. And then the reality sets in. You're like, oh, this job sucks too. You're like, I want to go back to my old job. At least there, you know, it was a two-minute drive to work instead of an eight-minute drive. It was so much better. You know what always happened when I had those moments? My loving wife would come alongside me and be like, hey, Matt, do you remember how awful that last job was? Can you remember the challenges that you had, the sleepless nights you had, the, 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 the stress that you encountered in those moments? And I'm like, no, I've lost all that from my memory. I just like that they gave me free coffee. Right? We hold on to these funny little things from the past. And we're like, I want to go build a house there. And the Lord's like, no, the promised land's actually just two days ahead of you. We're like, no, I'd rather just sit here and mull about the past for the next 40 years. Both in the story here in Numbers, Moses has a little breakdown after the, the Israelites lose their mind. The best part about this is God being so humorous. He's like, you want me to eat? I'll give you meat. And he makes this um, flock of quail come in. Now you've got to imagine, there's like over 1.5 million Israelites living in the desert at this point. And he brings in enough quail, these little birds, to make them have so much meat that they begin to come, become sick because of how much meat they have. They were like, I just wish I could meet again. And God's like, you want me? I'll give you meat. I know that voice as a parent. You, know, you want sugar? I'll give you sugar, kid. You'll, then you'll spend the next 25 minutes in the bathroom throwing up because of how much sugar you want. And so God brings them the quail and they eat it and then they get sick because of it because they're just so greedy. 
And Moses is weeping and he's, oh my goodness, what is going on? Moses actually declares, this is my favorite part, he's like, God, why did you call me to leave these people? It would be better if I was just dead. So look, here's the deal, God. Either kill me or change these people. With the <laughs> dead. <laughs> a peanut gallery. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> Do you know what God does? He raises up leaders to come alongside Moses. He brings along friends. He brings along community to share the burden, to share the load, to recall the promises that God has. If we turn back to Philippians 3, do you know what, what Paul says immediately following uh, verse um, 13 and 14? He says, therefore, since we're striving on, follow and come along with us. This is where we have um, Paul's verse of, of, of saying, copy, mimic, as I follow Jesus, follow me, and learn what it looks like to follow Jesus. That speaks of community. We can get entrenched and lost in empathy or uh, in, in, um, in apathy or in looking behind us and setting up campsites where we were supposed to only have a checkpoint. But when we have people around us that encourage us, that call us onward to the onward calling and upward calling of Christ Jesus, we can throw these things off. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, says, since you were surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, witnesses that, that speak of, declare, remind you of God's goodness and his glory, let us throw off the chains that so easily ensnare us and let us run after Jesus. Friends, the past is in the past and we can learn from it. We don't need to live in it. God's brought us to the present He's leading us into the future, and he's taught us things back here. Who knows that five years ago, you learned things that are helping you walk through challenges today. Ten years ago, 15, 20 years ago, there is wisdom in this room that has lived three times as long as I have. That can share experience from the past to help as I go through my present. That's why we need mentors. That's why we need each other. That's why we need the generations within the body of Christ. My peers don't know what tomorrow brings. My peers don't know what struggle they'll face tomorrow. We can conjecture and sound philosophical, but the generations that have gone ahead can say, hey, I remember going through that time in life when my, when my kids were that age. And here were some of the things that the Lord taught me you only have 52 Saturdays a year to make me count. You only have 18 years with those kids. And then, then they left. Although nowadays in 2022, kids go to college and then go back to live with their parents because they can't live anywhere else. So maybe I'll have more than 18 years with my kids. Not, I'm not, it's not a hope, but it's a reality that I'm preparing myself for. We need one another. I encourage you, friends, to be friends. Be friends. Come alongside. Be involved as a great cloud of witnesses. And maybe some of us will enter that cloud of witnesses really mediocrely. You know, like we're not quite great. But we'll get there together. Why? Because we're pressing on to the completion of Christ Jesus in our lives together. We encourage one another. We come alongside one another to follow Jesus. And sometimes we'll be the one saying, hey, remember the promises God spoke into your life. Yeah, the, the leeks and the onions were good, but think about the milk and honey. We're moving forward. We're pressing on. Let's remember the hardships and the lessons we learned, but let's not dwell there. Let us go and dwell in the house of the Lord. Let us go and dwell in the promises of God. And other times, friends, you'll be the one that needs to be encouraged. When you're in trouble, and all your friends, and I don't remember that song from my childhood. I have no idea who sings it. Someone shout it out. The Withers? Bill Withers. Thank you, man who is younger than me and knows it. <laughs> I love that song. Because at some point, you know what? I'm going to need someone to lean on. 
we can lean on one another. Sometimes the grass seems greener in the past, maybe it's greener on the other side, but in the midst of the desert, let's look forward to the promises that God has for us. Let's remember the miracles that he's doing. Let us recount them, count our blessings one by one. We want to learn from the past, but we don't want to get stuck there. This desert we're walking through, friends, is actually a time where God is teaching us, refining us. In the Christian faith, we use a, a very uh, large 25-cent word called sanctification, which simply means he is making us more like him. Each and every day, stripping away things from our past, healing hurts in our heart, replacing lies in our minds with the truth of his principle and his word. And each and every day, we have a decision to either go back the lies, or to press on, as he brings healing and health and wholeness to our lives and to those around us, as he transfers us from captivity of bondage uh, and slavery to sin, into now progressing towards completion in Christ Jesus, to that upward calling that he has for you, to that plan that he has to prosper you and not to uh, destroy you. It's not going to happen instantly. It's not a bag of microwave popcorn. We have individuals in this room well into their 80s, well into their 90s. I sit here in my 30s going, man, I want it now. You know, you have a car payment, you're like, oh, only seven more years. And then it's paid off. You're like, no, I want to pay that off now. God, I want your promises right now. And he's like, no, you actually need to walk through the desert. So that when you experience the promise, you're refined and capable of appreciating and understanding it. Because there are things you're going to learn in this desert that are going to cause you to understand what is happening now. Let us pursue Jesus. And let us echo the words of David. I'm going to call the worship team back up here. Echo the words of David in Psalm 119, verse 32. I will run in the direction of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. I will not be, I will not swerve, nor will I be slowed down. Church, I'm going to challenge you today to run in the direction of God's promises. Not camp in the fallacies of your past. Recognize the things that he's done the things that he's taught, and the things that he's leading you towards. Share those with someone. Share them around your dinner table tonight. About the promises that God's spoken into your life. Maybe he's deposited on your heart a ministry. Maybe he says, hey, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to, I'm going to bring freedom from this sin, this temptation, this trap. Come alongside one another forgetting what lies behind, and grabbing a hold of the vision that God has given you. His word says that his people perish for lack of vision. So that's God's vision. Grab a hold of the promises of God that he's spoken. You can take them to the bank, the one who promises is faithful, and he always delivers upon them. God, I want to grab onto that promise that you spoke into me when I was 17. When I was 54, when I was 85, God, I want to grab onto those promises. Cling to his spirit and his word, and let us press on together in this race he has called us to towards the glory of King Jesus. Church, we're going to worship together, and then we're going to have a time of prayer as well. Why don't you stand and join us for worship? Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, Lord turn his face toward you.
Thank you.